So, you want to send HDMI video all over your house. Maybe you're crazy like me, and you want to put all your computers in your basement server rack, and then connect to any computer from any desk in the house. That's my goal. But maybe you have simpler needs. Maybe you want to share a cable or satellite TV box with a couple TVs in the house. Or maybe you want to stream content from your office to your living room without a proprietary solution like AirPlay or Chromecast. And you don't want to pull any new wires. Just use the Ethernet that you already have. In this video, I'm going to cover a couple different methods for sending HDMI video over long distances using Ethernet wiring. So if you want to send HDMI video around your house, you really have about six solutions. Your first option is to get a long cable and run it through the wall. This is probably the cheapest, but depending on how far you're going, it might not be ideal. If you just want to put your media cabinet or your computer a few feet away and hide the wiring in the wall, that's perfectly fine. Do that. But when you start running HDMI through the attic, then you're asking for a bad time. HDMI was not designed to go super long distances, so you need thicker and thicker cables and eventually it just won't work at all. Also, you can't repair an HDMI cable. Ask me what it's like to go back in the attic and put a new cable in after you already ran a cable. Because I've broken an HDMI connector off trying to mount a TV on the wall, and that was not fun. Very, very sad day. Your next option is an active optical cable. These are HDMI cables with fibers built in. They do all of the fiber translation for you, so they look just like a regular HDMI cable. Some of them need power too. These can absolutely go the distance, but they're also relatively expensive. And also, they're fixed at a certain HDMI standard and bandwidth. So when newer HDMI revisions come out, you can't just replace the ends, you have to replace the entire cable through the wall. There are, or at least there used to be, passive adapters that would split up an HDMI into more than one RJ45. But these are pretty awful, because you're relying on an HDMI signal designed to run over a carefully made cable, and instead you're sending it over Cat5e or Cat6, which is not really something it was designed to do. But at least you can use Cat6 that's already in the wall, if you have it. Then we get to solutions that convert HDMI into RJ45 to run over Cat5 or Cat6 cable. All of these will absolutely work. You can use the Ethernet wiring already in your house, but it's important to remember that these are not based on Ethernet, so you can't use your Ethernet switches, and you can't usually carry Ethernet over the same wiring. There is a standard for this called HDBase-T, and HDBase-T is currently able to send 4K 60 frames per second with 444 chroma sampling, which is 18 gigabits per second of video over a single CAT6A cable. But it's important to note that I said CAT6A, not CAT6. The standard doesn't officially allow you to do that over CAT6. So if all you have is CAT6, you're limited to 420 chroma subsampling, which is still probably fine, but something you should be aware of. So these solutions are able to push beyond gigabit because they're not using standard Ethernet infrastructure. And that means they're still point to point. You're connecting one transmitter to one receiver. So if you're building the ultimate home theater, HD base T or an active optical cable or conduit is probably what you want to go with. But I'm not doing that. In fact, I barely even watch TV. I get my news from Reddit. I care about desktops, workstations, and gaming. All things I can do on my computer. And actually, I have a couple of computers. I have some that run Linux, like my test system over here. I have my thin clients that I play with. I have my big gaming desktop that heats up my bedroom. And what I'd really like to be able to do is put all of those in the basement, where they can use all the power and make all the noise they want and stay out of my life. But then, when I want to use one for my living room, or my bed, or my office, or another office, I can choose which computer I want to be connected to and use it like I'm sitting at it, without all the hassle of running a whole bunch of HDMI wires from every computer to every display. So that means I need a switch. I need all of my sources to come in and get distributed to all of my displays with the ability for the display to select which source it's coming from. So given my goals in mind, I was specifically looking for the sixth option, HDMI over IP. What this does is it compresses the HDMI video stream down to a bandwidth that fits within gigabit ethernet, and then it carries it over standard gigabit ethernet hardware. This means I can use the network wiring and also the network switches I already have in my house. And because I can use the network switches, that means that I can switch where the video goes. Now the hardware I've chosen does actually support 16 transmitters and 253 receivers. And any of the receivers can connect to any of the transmitters. 
potentially all of them connecting to the same transmitter if you want to do that. And that means I can now have 16 computers in my house connected to a whole bunch of displays and choose from the display which computer I want to be using. And on the back end, my network switches cost the same as any other network switches, which is not that much. It's a whole lot cheaper than buying an HD-based T matrix, I'll tell you that. The hardware I'm using for this video is sold by and was provided to me by Testmart. While they did supply me with the hardware, no money changed hands, and I reached out to them asking for these products to do a video. So hopefully you can jump in with me as I explore HDMI over IP and how using standard networking protocols can drastically reduce the cost of HDMI distribution. So this is the box I got. Let's take a look at what's inside. So we got a user manual. We got a piece of foam, and two units. Take a look at these in a sec. Under that we've got, take see what that is in a sec. Another one. It's like an IR receiver, IR transmitter, and a remote with 16 buttons. I'm guessing that corresponds to the 16 transmitters you can tune to. So this one I believe is a power supply. Sure is. So it looks like we've got 5 volt, 2 amp. It's got a pretty standard barrel jack. I didn't measure it, but it doesn't look oddly sized. It's not USB, but that is the same voltage as USB. So if you want to power it off like a TV's USB port or something, I'm sure that's possible. And I guess this one is another power supply. Yeah, same thing. So one for each side. And star of the show itself. Oh boy. Receiver. And... Transmitter. So this is everything we got here in the box. So we got the transmitter, transmitter's power supply, the IR blaster, because IR goes from receiver to transmitter. Transmitter blasts it on whatever device uses IR. The receiver, this is where the TV goes. Receiver's power supply, IR receiver if you need it, IR remote if you need it. Taking a look at these boxes, so they got five volt in, it's labeled UTP, but it is ethernet. So you can connect this to Ethernet switches and Ethernet devices. It will work. And the bandwidth it uses isn't even that high, as we'll see later. And then HDMI input. So if you just need HDMI, you just have to use this one side of the device. On the other side, we have the infrared out, USB out. That's a full-sized USB-B. So it's not USB-C or micro. And then there's a seven-segment display for what... Address it is 1 through 16 and a button to change it. The receiver is similar. Interestingly, this side has Ethernet and this side has it on the receiver. So it almost looks kind of upside down. Receiver, you got the same story power, Ethernet, HDMI out. So if that's all you need, you don't have to mount it with the other side accessible. And on the other side, we have IR in, keyboard and mouse. This is strictly for keyboards and mice, it is not passing through raw USB data. It's just passing through the HID keyboard and mouse data and the address of the receiver. So to do the most basic test of these HDMI extenders, I've got a pretty basic setup here we can test with. This is a thin client I reviewed in a previous video. It has a DisplayPort output that's going to a monitor with an HDMI input. So I have a DisplayPort to HDMI adapter cable. I've got this little keyboard and mouse plugged in over USB 2. So you can see, it's booted up, it's running Ubuntu, it's working. So now we're going to bring in the pair of extenders here. So we got the HDMI input side and the HDMI output side. So let's just put them like this. So this is HDMI from the thin client. We're going to go into the input on the transmitter. I'm going to power both of these from the ugly purple power strip. Power going in there. Now we're going in here. Okay. The USB keyboard. This USB to my keyboard. I'm going to plug it into the receiver. So here is a USB cord I have. Important to note if you're actually going to use USB, it doesn't come with one of the USB cables in the box. 
so I have to buy one. They're not super common anymore, even though it is a USB standard connector, and it has been for decades. Now HDMI. So HDMI to the monitor going to the receiver. So now I've got everything connected except Ethernet. So as the logo came up, that means we have no connection. They wouldn't connect anyway because this one's a five and that one's a one. Let's plug in the network and see what happens. Got the tiniest little ethernet cable here. So now we need to match their addresses. So I'm gonna put the transmitter on address two. So just keep clicking the button until we're on two. And I'll put the receiver on two as well. Boom. There's my thin client. Keyboard connected to the receiver, monitor connected to the receiver, ethernet connected to the transmitter, USB to the thin client, HDMI to the thin client. So this is the most basic setup you could do. You could take this cable and extend it hundreds of feet. Gigabit ethernet supports 100 meters, which is 330 feet. If you need to go that far, that's a thing. But the real advantage that these things propose is that they should be able to use ethernet switches to hook up more than one of these. So we should be able to share a network with our existing home network and not have to run all new cabling just for this HDMI. So now we brought this little thing in, intercepting our traffic. This is a Microtik Hex, and it is basically a low cost router switch. And it can act as a network switch or as a router and do a couple of other things. And I'm gonna use it to measure how much bandwidth is going across this link. Because in theory, these things could be using a full gigabit per second, which would mean they're not compressing the image a whole lot. But they could also be using something like H.265 compression and compressing it down to a few megabits. So we will see. The reason that's important to know how much bandwidth they're using is because if we want to connect a bunch of these all over our house and we want to use the same cabling that we're already using for our home network and for our Wi-Fi, we don't want a gigabit of bandwidth from one of these to start causing problems for our Wi-Fi. So I've got Winbox pulled up and I have the transmitter connected to Ether 4 and the receiver connected to Ether 3. So we can see the transmitter sending about three, two to three megabits per second, which is not outrageously high, but the screen isn't really doing anything. So what happens if we play back a video is the bandwidth gonna go up. So I've got a video playing full screen and it looks like our bandwidth is jumping up to between four and five megabits per second here. 5.5 is roughly the peak that I've seen. And this isn't a super intense video, so I guess that makes sense. Another thing to note about this is this uses IP multicast. So what that means is instead of broadcasting this video from the transmitter to the receiver or from the transmitter separately to each receiver, it's sending it out to the group, the multicast group, and letting the switch decide which receivers it should send it to. And if your network supports IGMP and multicast, then the bandwidth of these devices can easily be shared across the network. So if you're using unmanaged switches that don't do support IGMP or multicast, you'll end up flooding the network with a bunch of data because this is running at like five megabits per second. And five megabits per second from each of your transmitters broadcast out to everyone is not a great thing. So you might want to have separate switches if you're going to go that approach. Another approach you can have is to use managed switches or smart switches that do support IGMP. And then the switch will know which receivers would like to receive a certain multicast group and only send it to those uh, destinations. So in this case, this device I'm using from Microtik does support IGMP and it is enabled. So it's only sending data to the receiver on Ether3 because that's the only one that's subscribed to it. And this is not anything fancy. This is a pretty common internet standard for multicast. So it should not be hard to find equipment that supports multicast and IGMP to build a network out of this. Okay, so if you are really curious how it does IP, it looks like the devices are self-assigning IP addresses in the 192.168.167 region. So hopefully you're not using that region for your network, but if you're not, that won't really conflict because you can have more than one IP subnet on the same layer two they just won't be able to talk to each other. And in general, it's using the multicast group as I expected it would for data. It looks like it's using two, di two different ports, but I guess that's for it to decide. And then occasionally we'll see unicast traffic as well. And I believe that is USB data. 
So now that we know that these things do work, and they do work with standard Ethernet hardware, let's set up a bit of a more real-world test. So I've got the transmitter hooked up to my desktop computer. It's mirroring this screen on the HDMI output to the transmitter. I have USB connected back to the desktop, and Ethernet is connected to my home network. So I'm relying on my home network's wired Ethernet switches to transmit video. I'm going to try gaming on this setup from another office around the house. So for the receiver side of this experiment, I've got the IPKVM extender. It's hooked up to a network cable that goes all the way down to the basement to my network switch. I've got a monitor attached over HDMI. I've got my keyboard, my gaming mouse. This is a wireless mouse, but it's not Bluetooth. It has a dongle and it's plugged in to one of the keyboard and mouse ports. For audio, I have a pair of earbuds. They're plugged into the monitor. The monitor supports HDMI audio, but doesn't have speakers. So I have to plug into an output from the monitor or otherwise separate the audio out of the HDMI. Because this does support audio, but it only over HDMI. So as you know, I've used Portal for testing in the past. I'm pretty good at it, I like to think. All right, I guess you'll be the judge of that. Let's see how this goes. Dun dun dun, keep out. It's my favorite part of the game, the old section. I love this section. So we gotta go up there. Not letting you guys hear the audio because I don't want any copyright strikes here. Ah, it feels fine to play on. Again, I've usually done 60 FPS gaming. I don't do high frame rate gaming. But if you're comparing this to something like Steam Remote Play or Moonlight, it's on par with those for sure. Seems like the uh, volume keys in the keyboard aren't getting passed through. Something to be aware of if you need those. Whee! Oh yeah! So for this test, I wanted to throw in a lot of the features that it's supposed to support all at once. So we've tested directly linking them. We've tested them over my home network. Now we're gonna test multiple transmitters, multiple receivers. So this TV here has the second receiver. And as you can see, it's connected to my gaming PC of my bedroom. But using their infrared remote that came with it, I can switch over to the TiVo. TiVo is down in the cabinet. It's got its own transmitter, transmitting ID2. So when I click two on the remote, I get the TiVo. Now, if you're like me, you probably had a really hard time finding devices that use infrared. And the TiVo was the only device I could find in my house that used an infrared remote. I normally use the Apple TV, which has an RF remote. So I tried to test if the infrared forwarding works through this system. And it didn't work with the TiVo. That doesn't mean it won't work with anything else, but if I aim my TiVo remote at the receiver here, got an IR blaster facing into the TiVo, and I don't get anything. But if infrared's important to you, compatibility might not be perfect. I don't have any other devices I can test with, really, so this is what it is. Now I can game from down here on the couch, because why not? So I'm back up here at another TV in the house, and I have the second receiver. So the first receiver was downstairs. The first transmitter is connected to my gaming desktop. The second transmitter is connected to the TiVo, and the second receiver is connected up here. So you can see I'm able to see the TiVo over the network. I did confirm also that the TiVo is using HTCP and it has negotiated HTCP. So I'm not sure what the requirements are for that, but it works. I've got the IR receiver here again. Can switch back to the gaming desktop. So all of these little HDMI boxes are just connected to my home network with wired ethernet. I'm not doing anything special. I have a switch that does support IGMP snooping. It is a managed switch, but other than using a managed switch, I'm not segregating them with VLANs. I'm not using a separate switch. They're just plugged into regular network drops around my house. They go down to the basement. They get switched. They come back up everywhere. 
So the cost of cabling to set up something like this is the same as setting up a home network. You don't have to pull HDMI through the walls. It's pretty great if this is what you care about. So for the next trick, I've hooked up the Apple TV. So the Apple TV is one of the most modern devices I have, and it is working. If I use its RF remote, good stuff. One test I wanted to try was to see if I could use the TV's remote over HDMI CEC. So CEC is a protocol that's part of HDMI that allows the TV to send commands to devices downstream or devices downstream to send command back upstream to the TV. So for example, the Apple TV uses this. When you say sleep all connected devices, it's using CEC to turn off the TV. But likewise, the TV can share its remote buttons with other things over HDMI. Which unfortunately is not working over the HDMI over IP bridge. So another feature to consider if it's important to you. Now for using the computer, none of this matters. You use a keyboard and mouse, probably some sort of wireless keyboard plugged in there, all will be good. So thanks for coming along on my tour of HDMI over IP. These units specifically have worked very well for a lot of the use cases that I care about, specifically working with computers. Keyboard and mouse support is just fine, the latency is very low, and I can do general desktop office work, video editing, gaming, all that good stuff. In addition, while working with these, I found a bunch of use cases that I hadn't expected going into this video. So in addition to running a YouTube channel, I also mentor a lot of elementary through high school robotics teams, and I run competitions for them. During these competitions, I often have to set up a dozen Windows laptops to show rankings and statistics all around the event, and that's a giant pain. Using these extenders, I can connect all of my screens around the event to my network that I'm already running, and use one HDMI output on my desktop to drive all of them. I didn't think of that before I started this video, but now I want to use these for that too. There's also some business use cases. If you're the kind of business that likes having screens all over with information or advertising, whatever your business is into, you can drive them all with this instead of having a little Raspberry Pi, which you can't buy anymore, at every single display. And since they're based on IP, you can trunk them over fiber long distances like you would with any other IP traffic. So what about downsides? If you're using them for media, they don't support HDMI CEC, so you can't use the remote control on your TV to send commands to devices over HDMI. Now, this was not advertised as a product feature, but it's a feature that would be useful to me. I also wasn't able to get infrared to work with my TiVo. Now, that doesn't matter to me because I don't use TiVo. I use Apple TV, which has an RF remote. But if you still like using infrared, it's something to consider. These are also limited to 1080p at 60 frames per second, which is clearly advertised on the product page, and it's perfectly fine for my office use cases. But if you're trying to do 4K or high refresh rate gaming, it won't work for you. I've got a huge list of projects coming up doing all sorts of weird stuff. So like and subscribe if you want to see more of that in the future. If you want to chat directly or have suggestions for future videos, you can slide into my Discord, link down in the description below. I do always love hearing from subscribers about how they've used my videos to develop something cool in their life, and I would love to hear from you as well. So hopefully you can come along for my future topics, and as always, I'll see you on the next adventure.